Hello, I'm Tim Smith, pastor of the Fayetteville Cumberland Presbyterian Church. And we're delighted to have you with us today for this time of worship and study of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And wherever you may be watching us from, whether it's on our church YouTube channel or you may be watching on Fayetteville Public Utilities Channel 6. Either way, we're delighted to have you with us. And if you are in the Fayetteville area, we'd love to have you come and worship with us in person. Today I'm going to be reading a passage that we have probably heard before from Mark's Gospel. It's coming from chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, and it is the story of the widow's might and the widow that cast in her two mites in their offering plate. Beginning in verse 41, Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and watch the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which are worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and said to them, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who have, are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had and all she had to live on. And may God bless the reading of his holy word and the client's hearing to our hearts and our minds and its application to our lives. I think most of us have heard the saying before, give it your all, or someone needs to give their all, or they gave their all. I know we hear that sometimes as a sports cliche and statement that maybe a player or a team played to the very best of their ability. Uh, they gave it the 100% effort. They did everything that they could to be successful and they gave it their all. We hear that when it comes to being in business or in the workplace. We need to work hard and give it our all. We hear it even in our own families we need to give it all to our marriage or we need to give it all to our children. But when we make those statements about giving it all or giving everything, what are we really meaning? What is the definition of that? I was thinking about that this week and as I was, I kept kind of drawing a blank because anytime I would try to explain to myself or come up with the definition for giving it your all, I kept coming back to other cliches like all in or not holding back or fully committed. I think we know what it means. It means that we work hard, we try our best, we put in the necessary time, the energy, the resources to plan to prepare, to train, and in the end, execute whatever our plan is so that it might be successful. The story that I read from Mark's gospel today is about a lady that was all in. She gave it her all to the Lord. And it is a story that for us really to be able to understand and appreciate we have to sort of know the context and we have to set the, the scene, set the stage. On this particular day, Jesus was at the temple. Just a few minutes before this, he had been in a sort of heated discussion with some of the priests and Pharisees, Sadducees, and so forth. And he had taken a break from that and had gone over uh, to one of the inner gates inside the temple. And while he was there, he was near one of the offering boxes. These were boxes that were put up at different entrance and exits to certain temple areas. And when people would enter or leave, they would put in a contribution. Now the box was designed in such a way that you really would not know how much somebody gave or did not give. You wouldn't be fully sure, but you could have a good indication. You might could see if they put in gold coins or silver ones or copper ones. You might also be able to have heard the sound when it went in. 
And we are told that Jesus sat at a distance away from this collection box. And he and his disciples were sitting there. And he was watching as people came by giving their offerings. Apparently, there were some very wealthy people that came to the temple that day. And they gave enormous sums of money. We might say today in the thousands of dollars that were contributed Yet then the widow came, and she put in two of the smallest coins, two of the very smallest coins in Jewish currency, a mite. Two mites together, we are told, equals a penny. Yet Jesus was impressed, and Jesus says to his disciples that she has given more than anyone. Not only has she given more than anyone that came by and gave, but she has given more than everyone that had come through that day combined together. Well, how can that be? How could it be that you could give one penny and that would be more than what everyone else is given. After all, you can't buy anything with a penny. I, I don't know anywhere in the year 2021 you can go and buy anything for a penny. I, I do remember my parents used to run a, a, a convenience store. And that was back in the early 90s. You could buy some super bubble bubble gum, the individual piece, for three cents. That was then. That took three pennies. I mean, one penny wouldn't even buy anything then, nevertheless now. So how could that be more than these wealthy people that have given money? We've got to think they gave in the thousands of dollars. When you add them all together, it may well have been in the hundreds of thousands collected that day. So how could that be more than a penny? And it is here that we see the important lesson from Jesus' teaching. And that is that God judges us not on the total amount of what is done, but he judges us and evaluates us based on our opportunities and our abilities to serve and to do for him. In other words, Jesus is very concerned about the percentage that someone gives, the percentage of their time, the percentage of their money, the percentage of their talents and abilities that they use for the Lord's work, not just the total amount committed. You know, percentage is a very important thing. Uh, when I remember back to my math classes, I remember we often... Spent a lot of time on fractions. Didn't really spend that much time on percentages. Uh, I think that's because when you're dealing with fractions, you have to multiply, you have to divide, you have to add, you have to subtract. And so it, it's good practice for all your basic mathematical skills. But rarely do we use fractions. We might use half or thirds or fourths, but past that, we don't use them very much. But percentages make up a big part of our daily life. Think about figuring your sales tax, for instance. Here in Tennessee, I believe ours is 9.5%. And I've gotten used to that, and it doesn't sound very much. You go and buy a dollar's worth, that's 9.5 cents. You buy $10, it's 95 cents. Now, once you get it to buying $100, then it's $9.50. You're starting to get into a sizable amount of money. On 1000 it's $95. You begin, it begins to grow exponentially, doesn't it? I remember uh, about a month ago, I was volunteering doing some PTO work and I was working at the book fair and the various children were coming by buying books and different things and they would say, well, I've got this much money, I've got $5 and this book is $3 and this book is $2. And I had to explain to them, no, it doesn't work that way because you've got to pay the sales tax. We all know percentages are important. They're very important when it comes to our mortgages. 
to our credit cards and used to they were important when it came to our savings but now <laughs> you're doing good if you get one percent so it's not as important there i guess as it once was the point is god is judging us based on how much we give and do based on what we have the billionaire could come and give a million dollar gift to the church. Amazing what we could do with a million dollars. Think of all the ministry that could be done. Uh, I used to would have said if we got a million dollars here, we could finally get us a new heating and air system. But praise be to God as I speak, that is happening anyway. Uh, but if someone was going to give a million dollars, that, that's an unbelievable sum, is it not? Yet, if they were a billionaire, a million dollars would only be one-tenth of one percent. Whereas, what percentage did this widow give? Yes, she just gave one penny, a tiny speck to most of us, but she gave 100 percent, didn't she? She gave all that she had. She gave everything. She held nothing back. She gave it all to God. The Bible tells us to the one that much is given, much will be required. And for those of us that have been blessed with material resources, money and wealth, we have a responsibility and much is required of us to give to do the Lord's work and to do the ministry of the church and to help others that are around us and to help the poor and less fortunate and to advance the cause of Christ. It is the same with those that have been blessed with many abilities and talents. And let us not forget, we all have talents and abilities. Oh, the many times I have heard someone say, well, I, I just don't have any talents, preacher. If I had any talent at all, I would use it. My friends, no one has been given every talent, and we all have talents. It may be different talents, and it is different talents. It may be talents that we don't come that don't come to the front of our mind when we think about uh, church work. Like we might not have the talent to be a good public speaker, so we couldn't preach or teach. We might uh, not have musical skills or talents. Uh, we might not be a very outgoing person to be a welcomer at the church. But we all have talents. You know, some have the talent to be in a wonderful cook. They can use that. To cook for functions at the church and also to help with uh, uh, taking food maybe to the bereaved or to the sick or, or to those that don't have to eat. You know, somebody may say, well, you know, my, my gift is uh, uh, carpentry. What a great gift. I... I have to be honest with you, I've got the gift to sit here and talk to you and get up and talk to people, but carpentry is not my gift. I really would rather have it. I'll be honest with you, I wish I was better at those things, but we don't get to pick those things. But the carpenter or the plumber or the electrician, they can do great work for the Lord. There's always things that be done, need to be done on the church facilities. There's things that need to be done. We think about the homes of the elderly, the poor. You think about the homes of the, being built for the homeless or maybe going doing mission work where storms have come through or tornadoes have come through or Habitat for Humanity and those types of programs. The great athlete, the one that's the skilled athlete, they can use the talent of their publicity and their fame. They can use that to... Be a witness for Jesus Christ. The accountant and the one good with money and finances, they can use that to guide the church and its entities with financial decisions and being a good steward and also can help to those that uh, struggle. And we, we all know people like this. You may be one yourself that struggles when it comes to the managing of your own personal finances and resources. So we all have gifts and we are judged based on how we use them. We're not judged against one another. We're not going to be judged by how good a job we did at this or that. We're going to be judged at what ability did God give you 
and give me, and how well did I use that for the cause of Christ? I might say, hey, I can't do anything here when it comes to working on the air conditioner at church. Well, fortunately, God's not going to judge me on that. But he is going to judge me on what type of pastor I am or how well I proclaim the word and stand for his principles. And the opposite can be true for you. He's not going to judge you and evaluate you based on how good a preacher you'd be if he's not giving you the gift to preach. But he is going to evaluate you based on the gifts you have been given and how well you use them for the Lord's work. See, we have to remember something, and that is that the Bible teaches us that we are stewards. We are stewards of everything that we have. We are not owners. I know that in economics class, we were taught in the capitalist system that we as individuals owned all the money, the land, the labor, the capital, the entrepreneurial ability. And that's true from a capitalist perspective. But the Bible teaches us that, in fact, God owns everything. We might call it, I read a book once entitled The Economy of God, and I think that's a good way to describe it. The Bible says, in fact, we do not own such things, but are merely stewards or caretakers of those things, that we have been entrusted them by God. In fact, it is God that has given us our abilities, our knowledge, our wisdom, our skills, it's God that has blessed us with whatever material resources we have gained. It's God who has blessed us with success. And it is God that has given us our mental capacity, our health, and this day of life. For God is our creator, and none of us, none of us could do anything if we weren't here. None of us, if we were not alive, <laughs> could do anything. None of us, if we did not have some mental knowledge or some wisdom or some God-given skills would be able to do anything. And because of that, we are to be caretakers of what God has given us. And we are to use those things for God's glory and God's work. We see here in this story that this widow was willing to give all that she had. She was all in, wasn't she? She gave it everything. And when we look at this story, there's one thing that's just absolutely amazing about it, isn't it? That just jumps out at you. <laughs> and that is that she gave everything. She had one penny. That's all she had in the world. And she gave it all away. Could we do that? I'll be honest with you, I don't think I could. It's here we see her level of faith and commitment. See, it would have been easy for her to have said, well, hey, why should I give this penny? After all, all these other people have put all these other big amounts of money in. They might have said, well, God should have blessed me more. If he wanted me to give more, he should have blessed me more. Or maybe we might say, hey, the temple can't do anything with a penny. I mean, it won't pay a priest's salary. It won't give any food to the needy. It won't accomplish anything. And it is there that we get ourselves in trouble. Because we often think we don't have the talents. And then we think God will not miss us and we will not be missed. That our participation, our work, our input or our resources, whether physical resources or financial resources, won't be missed. See, Satan creeps in and whispers in our ear that our attendance won't be missed at church. No one will know if we were there or not, and if they did, uh, everything will go on okay. It won't detract from the service experience of others or the work of the church in general. We think... The small group won't meet, miss us, or the Bible study won't miss us, or the Sunday school class won't miss us, and we forget that our presence is important there, and maybe our comment, or maybe the question we ask, or something that we say may be meaningful to another person. We think there are plenty others that can do it as well as I, if not better, so why am I needed? 
But let us not fall into that um, series of excuses. Let us not stumble there. Instead, let us as this widow give it our all. She had the opportunity that day to give all that she had to God, and she did it gladly. See, that's where we get in trouble too. Because God not only judges, judges us on our abilities and what we could do, what we're capable of, but he also judges us on how we use our opportunities. Often when we're in church, especially after we've heard a discussion about giving it all with God or about the widow's might or uh, some other biblical character's sacrifice, we begin to think, well, you know, Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. And we say, God, if, you, if the opportunity comes my way today or later this week, I'll do it, Lord. I will do it. I'll just be waiting for the opportunity to serve you. And I think we're sincere when we say that. However, however, I've learned this in my life. Those opportunities do come. And often they come at inconvenient times. Maybe when we're already late for something else we're doing. Maybe when we've already got a commitment. Maybe when we would rather be doing something else. But we must remember that even when opportunities are inconvenient, they are still opportunities to serve the Lord and we are to take them. I'm sure it was very inconvenient for this lady to put in that penny. After all, it was all she had. Just can't imagine all she had. That's about as deep a sacrifice as you can find. And see, with God, the more we sacrifice, the more time we give, the more resources we commit, the more we use our abilities and talents for his work, the more he is pleased. Jesus was greatly pleased by the commitment of this widow. And says she gave more than all the others combined because she gave it her all. And let us give our all to the Lord today and always. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for allowing us to be together. We ask your blessings upon each person watching this today. And may you fill them with your Holy Spirit. Open our eyes and our minds to the opportunities that we can be of service to you. And may we always jump at each chance to do your work. Reveal to us whatever talents and abilities we might have and whatever ways we might could be of service to you. Be with those today that are struggling, maybe struggling with faith, those that are sick, and please forgive us of our sins. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Once again, I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm Tim Smith. I'm the pastor at the Cumberland Presbyterian Church in Fayetteville, Tennessee. And we'd love to have you come and worship with us. We have our 8.30 a.m. worship service in the Fellowship Hall. And we have our 10.30 a.m. service here in the sanctuary. It's a little bit more traditional. The 8.30 is a little bit more casual. But whichever one you want to come to, we'd love to have you. And God bless each and every one of you this week.